Hey everybody, it's that time once more to go around the world one more time and have a beer or two along the way. It's Dan. And uh, first things first, uh, I'm sorry about the delay in getting the podcast out. I've had a few hiccups along the way, be it technical, be it personal and whatnot. So hopefully we'll get this out to you in time. Uh, and I also need to say thank you to Sarah Flora for being on the show two weeks ago. Uh, it was really fun having her on the show. Uh, and lots of knowledge go check her out on youtube uh follow her podcast now is actually pretty cool as well um and also a little bit of what's coming up uh uh, we also have coming up very soon an interview with the guys from experimental brewing uh denny khan and uh, drew beecham so stay tuned and uh, we'll go from there so this week we have a very cool guest we have mandy from beers with mandy who is a uh, an advanced cicerone a gold medal winning home brewer uh a, a writer for a new york uh column i believe is it a column or a paper um, yes, yeah, so I write for Vine Pair, which is a website that's uh, focused on all kinds of alcohol, wine, beer. Oh. Well, it could be worse things. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so uh, we are going to be talking about beer glasses this week. So uh, I know a lot of us have always thought a glass is just the vessel to get from point A to point B. So from the table to your mouth and then enjoying it. But from what I've read along the way, uh, a glass does different things to beer, be it containing aroma, helping gas, other containing CO2, releasing CO2. Uh, it can change molecular structure for some way, somehow. I don't know. I'm an army guy. <laughs> we make things go boom. So Mandy, thank you for being on the show this week. Greatly appreciate it. Uh, and also dealing with all the technical issues we've been having along the way. Uh, how about we uh, do, f- do first things first. How about we introduce you and uh, tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, so, I mean, you did a really good job. I'm uh, Mandy Neglich. I have a blog called Beers with Mandy that also has an Instagram account, uh, which is the way that we found each other. Um, but I'm also a food and beverage uh, journalist. I have, like I said, that home brewing column for Vine Pair, but I also write for outlets like Wine Enthusiasts and Good Beer Hunting. And I also write a column for Taste of Home Magazine. So kind of all over the place. Um, and I'm an advanced Cicerone. I'm a certified taster through Aroxa. And I have my W set in spirits. I'm working on my level two right now. So awesome. love, love to study all things. So I know we were talking earlier in the week and you are now studying for your master's in the Cicerone program, right? Correct. Hopefully that um, test will happen later this year, but obviously we're kind of in a wait and see state but yeah i've been studying for it yeah and that like i know uh initially i was telling you about a documentary i saw called for love of beer and there were at the, at that time there were only 16 uh, master cicerones in the world now after talking to you you're saying there's 19 yes i'm hoping to slide under get in that top 20 spot of the first 20 but yeah as of last year or last test i guess which would be two years ago now one person passed uh joe so now there's one spot left in the first 20. Wow. That's a bit of a daunting task. I mean, I don't think Ray Daniels pulls any punches now, does he? No, it's definitely a really intense test. It's way different than even the advanced one, a lot more practical hands-on testing and oral exams and that kind of stuff. So it's a two-day long gauntlet i'm excited to do nice so maybe next time we'll talk about the events about the cicerone program and uh we can pick your brain about that one yeah definitely all right so let's let's get into it so um beer glasses i mean uh according to history they date back a long way uh where they range from uh pottery uh pottery cups to metal tankards to glassware which was i think at the time when it was just starting to be used was for the the aristocracy or for the elite person people in the world i guess excuse me and so i guess what i'm asking what is what are the differences in uh in in glassware that we should know of for when we're looking at having a beer should we be just going from the straight old regular you know, everyday glassware glass should be actually be using, say, like a Manchester pint glass that you would see for a Guinness or a Weissen glass or whatever. Does does it really matter? 
Um, yeah, my whole philosophy on glassware is that it, it doesn't matter at all. Um, I think you summarized it perfectly in the intro. Uh, that's what I always say is a glass is just the container to get the beer to your mouth. Um, there's ways to upgrade that a little bit. You know, like you were saying, the release of aroma, the maintaining temperature, things like that. But really, as long as you have something to drink out of, it's way better than drinking out of a bottle or a can as far as your drinking experience. And a lot of glasses are just made for aesthetics. So whatever makes you feel fancy when you're drinking. <laughs> okay. So <laughs> um, what do some of the glasses do? I mean, do uh, the design of them, I mean, we you look at the ones that look the typical pub uh, mug, it's all dimpled like a golf ball. Do those dimples mm -hmm. really do anything? No, they're definitely just for aesthetics. So before the pub mug, there was the 10 sided glass, um, which was more, I guess, attractive when beers are really dark, but as brewing technology improved and they were able to figure out how to not burn all their malts to hell and make them so dark, um, you could kind of get more of an amber colored beer. And that's really when that dimpled look came in. Um, the dimples just, you know, refract light differently and make it um, look cool. I mean, back then also there was a lot, they just, refrigeration wasn't as, um, it, first of all, wasn't as prevalent, wasn't as cold, like you couldn't get things as cold. So you wanted to maintain that cold temperature of your beer a lot more. So all pub mm -hmm. mugs, basically the only way to pick it up is by the handle, whereas yeah. something like a wine glass, you could still pick it up by the bulb and, you know, kind of not use that uh, use of the glass of keeping the temperature, but a pub mug to be nice, thick glass, which also helps with um, heat transfer from the table. So that helps keep it mm -hmm. cold, but then getting your hand off the glass keeps it cold. Um, but now that we can refrigerate our beers <laughs> um, to sometimes far too cold, uh, that's yeah. not, a, not as much of a concern. So is that why like some of the glasses are actually pretty thick is to maintain temperature? Yeah, that's definitely one of the reasons. Um, I think, I don't remember when Sam Adams like came out with their Sam Adams Boston Lager special glass. That's kind of like between the Manchester pint, like we're talking about for Guinness and a tulip, but um it has a nice thick bottom and that's one of the reasons that they cite. Um, also, I mean, those like traditional glasses, it was just really hard to blow super thin glass. Mm -hmm. um, so they just ended up being thicker and that's kind of the traditional heavy uh, glass that we have. Okay. So there are a lot of, <clears throat> excuse me, a lot of non-traditional glasses out there. I mean, uh, mm -hmm. look at the one that uh, Dogfish and Sierra Nevada did with Spiegelu, where mm -hmm. it looks like a pistol grip and then tulips out which they use for they say that's an ipa glass and that is extremely thin when you get closer mm -hmm. to the top but the bottom the base of it is actually pretty thick so is that meant to warm it up to release more of the aromas or to change the flavor as it warms up yeah so the, they were developing that ipa glass back in the uh I guess you could say the early ages of or the early ages of craft beer IPA back when we were more that West Coast style, super bitter, um, kind of the aromas you'd be getting from hops would be grapefruit pith and pine and resin. Um, and so if you drank your beer too quickly, you would just get all of that bitterness and it wouldn't have time to release that aroma. Um, basically, a colder liquid liquid will hold on to more CO2, which also causes it to hold on to more aroma molecules. So what they were trying to do was exactly opposite of what they were trying to do with the pub mug. They wanted it to warm up more quickly. So you weren't just chugging a bitter IPA. You were getting more of that aroma release and really experiencing all that the hops had to offer. Um, when, li when liquid's colder, like I said, it holds on to the aroma and also you are more sensitive to that bitterness. So. Okay. So is that why like some of the glasses, like the tulips were they're flared in, then flared out a little bit? I mean, I understand that the flare out is to help control the head of the beer, which also helps maintain some of that CO2 gas inside so your beer doesn't go flat all the way. But um, does the design of the glass, like the tulip or say the snifter, really do anything to enhance the beer other than just to control the aroma um, a little longer? Yeah, so I think a good example, even beyond like the snifter or the tulip, is talking about the tiku glass, which is another one of those glasses designed by a brewer. He's actually a brewer in Italy, um, Teo Musso. I hope I didn't butcher his name, but um, he designed it to be the universal beer glass. So it basically looks like a wine glass at the bottom. It has a nice long stem for that really pretty presentation. 
Um, and then it has basically an angular top that goes in and that's what retains the aroma in the bulb of the glass. So basically by having that slant in, it's gonna hold the aroma there. So what it's waiting for your nose when you dip it in the glass. And then it pretty sharply slants back out um, kind of the way a tulip does curve at the top. It slants right back out. And that is to um, enhance the frothing over the rim as it's pouring into your mouth. So basically it gives a little resistance to the beer as it's pouring into your mouth and that forces more of the aroma out of the beer right when it's in your mouth. And because of that, um, that point, right, where it's so close to your mouth, you're breathing it in, that allows the aroma to go up the back of your throat, up your retronasal passageway and actually hit your olfactory bulb where we sense all aroma from the other side. So it can actually help you to sense a second, um, a second set of aromas in a way, or, or, or get a different viewpoint on the aromas, I guess. Okay. Um, so, but again, like that would totally happen over any, <laughs> any ridge, like right. even a solo cup would do that. So it's like, it, it doesn't help a little. Yeah. But I mean, if you were drinking out of like my tea mug that I'm drinking out of right now, you would still get that effect somewhat. So they can do little things to enhance it. But if you have a really special beer and you don't have the right glass for it, like don't wait to open your beer. <laughs> um, okay. You'll still get that frothing and all, all the benefits all right. out of anything you drink out of. All right. Um, I had, there it is. So I actually, like my wife a while ago got me a beer in the month club, bef like before I even got back into home brewing. So I've only been back into home brewing now for about two and a half years now. I was a home brewer a while ago, back in the early, God, early 2000s. <laughs> I freaking feel old now. Um, and with that came, uh, this pretty cool uh, beer tasting guide, and it's and also uh, things like uh, what the glasses are uh, and what kind of beer should go with it. So I don't know mm -hmm. if you if you can see that. Oh, there we go. Does that kind of make yeah. kind of makes sense. Mm -hmm. So it's saying that a wheat beer glass. It's the narrow center helps maintain carbonation while uh, the bulging top allows room for the head. Okay, so what's so special about a glass like that? I mean, like you said, a, a, a glass is meant to go from point A to point B. So mm -hmm. why do we need all these different glasses for, for beer? I mean, so again, it's like just going into tradition. Those are when they were first brewing Weiss beers and it was pretty cool that they were like this blonde color, but they had that kind of protein haze. Um, they were displaying that so that looks beautiful in that long um tall glass it's also enhancing the color uh just like i mean if you're a home brewer right you you know when you're transferring your or when your beer is in the carboy it looks like super dark even though it's a belgian golden strong but mm -hmm. then when it's going through the transfer line you're like oh it's really light so i mean the same thing happens with the glass right if you stretch it out and make it that nice tall glass it's going to look much lighter in color which is back when they were brewing these beers for the first time was like very desirable you know it was all beer was kind of like either very dark or amber color. Um, so that was a way to show it off. And then, yeah, the structure of that glass, um, the way it slowly, it subtly slopes out allows the head, which you're gonna have a lot of in a Weiss beer to build on itself and basically maintain its structure and stick around longer. Um, that's obviously something, it's a sign of a very good Weiss beer is um, having a really nice big three, four inch head. Um, so if you're able to do that as a brewer, you want to show that off and make sure your glass is nice and big to um, showcase that. So are, are traditions mainly the big driving force behind a lot of the glasses that we're seeing today, like be it from the Pilsner glass all the way up to say maybe a tulip? Yeah, I would say tradition and, and aesthetics. I mean, there's, of course, like as you're getting geekier and geekier, you want those little improvements, right? Like you want to make sure your um, beers frothing over the edge of the glass. You want to be served maybe like um, the Stanga glass that Kolsch is served in those really small serving sizes. I think it's, I want to say 30 milliliters, but that sounds way too small. Um, 30 <laughs> cents liters. Um, okay. that's, I'm like, uh, that they serve it to you really cold. It's a beer that you want to drink cold and crisp. And so that's the reason that glass exists. But um, I think if you're just getting into beer, it's definitely not something you should be like intimidated by or feel like, oh, I can't, I can't, 
drink my stout without a tulip glass because it's going to ruin the beer. Um, a lot of it is aesthetics. I mean, I don't know how much you're scrolling through Instagram, but you've seen all of those like really crazy glasses that are like basically more of a vase than a glass. And, oh like, God. That's... <laughs> I think yeah, we were we, we were talking about this earlier in the week about like you see those ones like the the yard where it comes on a on a, a stand and it's got that big bulge at the bottom, or there's mm-hmm. the or the big glass boot. I mean, w- what is the purpose behind that other than trying to drink on a dare? <laughs> I mean, I think those like especially quack is the one that you're referring to with that comes on its own like coaster basically. A lot of that was marketing. Um, in Belgium, they basically, they're very strict about their glassware to the point if you're at a bar that serves Orval and they have Orval, but they don't have a clean Orval glass at the moment, they're going to wait for you to either get like, you're going to have to wait to wash, get a glass wash or wait till whoever's done using it. Um, Cause they're very strict about that. And that was something that breweries could do to market themselves, you know, give these bars more glassware, have prettier, better glassware, or like Chimay has the different sizes. Um, so those are things that they could do to like set themselves apart. I believe the quack has something to do with, it has its own handle. So you didn't have to like look at the beer to drink it. You could keep looking forward if you were driving your horse and buggy. Um, <laughs> but another thing is like you get come into the bar, right? If you're in Belgium where you're kind of like, you know, you're going to get a special glass and you see this crazy thing with like wood and everything. There's only two in the whole bar. So you're like, okay, when he's done with that glass, I want whenever beer comes in that glass kind of thing. Um, okay. so more, that's a more of a marketing thing. And I mean, that's another kind of thing that I think people are a little funny about. Like if you go visit a brewery, like I have some Russian river glasses, but I drink all kinds of beer out of them. <laughs> I don't, it doesn't have to be <laughs> Russian river, but I know some people like won't post on their Instagram if it's the wrong logo with the wrong beer right. or whatever. So I have a cupboard that's full of different styles of beer glasses and I rotate them around. I don't care what oh, yeah. beer, what beer I, I have. If, if that's the mm-hmm. glass that's up on rotation, that's the glass I'm going to use. So, <laughs> I mean, if it's a Pilsner glass, I don't care. I'm going to throw a porter in it. Who cares? Like, like yeah. we were saying before, point A to point B. But <clears throat> if, if someone wants to be the beer snob and mm-hmm. go buy proper glass to proper beer, what kind of glassware should say someone who's just uh, starting out on this kind of weird venture mm-hmm. of the glass to the beer? What kind of glassware should a person maybe start with to understand what it does? Do you think? Um, I mean, I think a tiku is a nice place to start, just because it is something that a lot of breweries have adopted as being kind of the universal beer glass. Um, you know, I was up at Foam Brewers in Vermont and they serve basically anything that's not their IPAs and pale ales in the Tico, in the Tiku glass. Um, some of the stronger IPAs, they actually serve in the Tikus as well. Um, so that's a good place to start just because it does look nice. It's a little bit like a wine glass. Um, if you want to, you can hold it by the stem, which is mm-hmm. not going to warm up the beer. Um, it looks a little fancy. Um, I also think Becker, Willie Becker glasses are pretty popular now, especially at breweries. Um, they're kind of like the, they almost look like a column that tapers out and back in just very subtly. Um, they're in like a lot of brewery gift shops. They're very common in Munich for things like Dunkles. Um, they're just kind of a nice standard. They'll, they have that nice structure of the column that will help head retention if that's, if the beer you're pouring in there has head retention and they're thin enough to show clarity. Um, they're also really good in a dishwasher. They're not like as fragile and thin. Um, those Tiku lips tend to, a uh, you know, if they hit each other in the cabinet enough times, they'll get little chips in them. Whereas like a Becker glass is going right. to stay, stay well, nice and sturdy for you. Well, I'll say this, those uh, speed glue glasses that uh, uh, mm-hmm. Dogfish and Sierra Nevada did, they're not so indestructible. I've gone through, no. I've gone through two of those and it's not from me mm-hmm. breaking them. It's from, well, one going in the dishwasher and I guess something banged yeah. it. And mm-hmm. the other one, but after I replaced that one, my kids were doing the dishes and they got dropped and yep. it's like, all right, get the vacuum out. Cause we got three dogs and we don't want them cutting their paws yeah. up. So you're like, yeah, this is like, it's oh. glasses have changed so much. It, it's mm-hmm. ridiculous. I mean, I know I mentioned earlier in the show that, um, according to history, like glasses or glassware started out as like a, like a pottery mug or mm-hmm. a clayware. And, 
You well, really, have... I mean, animal skins were the first ones. <laughs> when you think of well, people discovering Isinglass and you're like, how did you discover fish bladders? It's because they were putting their drinks in fish bladders. <laughs> they came <Good>. out clear. <laughs> <laughs> good point. Okay, we go from a water, like a, a drinking skin to yeah. a pottery or pottery mug or vessel of some sort yeah. to yeah, metal. It, it's interesting to see how things have, have evolved, but you don't think back then they're like they're like okay put the put that kind of alcoholic drink in there i don't care about the shape or whatever mm -hmm. else i just want to get it down range what how do you think or why do you i guess it, what is your opinion on this is what i should say mm -hmm. that glassware has changed because it could be just like someone's felt like oh it's a marketing thing i want to change it over time or do you think they actually figured out that it actually does something to it um, yes, yeah, so, I mean, when you were when we were changing from clay, it went to wood. Um, and then that was like, I don't know exactly what plague it was. <laughs> um, <laughs> when they realized that drinking water and drinking vessels were dirty, and basically people were looking in their wooden glasses and being like, Oh, God, there's like stuff growing in my wooden glass, yep. um, which is when we switched to pewter, which also gave people lead poisoning. So again, getting sick from their glasses. Awesome. Um, but so <clears throat> that was something, you know, that when the tankards came about, it was basically you wanted the lid, like the things that are still, you still see them in Munich. And um, especially around Oktoberfest and uh, yeah. all of the like colonial American drinkware is going to have that lid to basically they thought they were keeping the bacteria out and they also didn't see all the nasty yeast cake and hop residue floating in their beer as they were drinking it because it was metal and they had a lid on it. <laughs> um, but I really think as beer, first of all, like you were saying, you know, rich people had access to um, people who could blow glass for them. So that became just like a status symbol. And then as beer became clear, you know, as the Pilsner came out and then they were able to start really clarifying beers and make them beautiful. I think that just influenced what people want to be drinking out of. You know, if you're at the bar and you're drinking out of a metal tanker and you can't see your brown beer in there and the people across from you are drinking the expensive clear Pilsner out of their clear glass, like that's right. just kind of a, a trend thing, I guess. Okay. Um, All right. Yeah. And then I would say more recently is like the people trying to develop it to enhance beer flavor where you're getting the Tiku glass or the Spiegelu um, IPA glass. Um, but for a long time, like the best beer glass was just a wine glass. So. Oh, I never thought of that. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah. Do you think that, you know, like this, the, gla the glassware thing is getting a little much, do you think that, you know, I know in my opinion, I mean, yeah, I'm, I have a collection of glasses and, and I've already said, I don't care what beer goes in what glass, but there's sometimes that I, I, I do. Okay. I'm having a stout. I'm putting it in a proper pint glass or mm -hmm. I'm having a sour. I'll use my Tiku glass or mm -hmm. whatnot. But do you think that all these glasses and where people are going with them is getting maybe a little bit out of hand? I mean, it's, it's I just think if you're having fun, then go for it. But if that's not what you're into, you also don't have to do it. I'm just very like, um, I think people love collecting these like silly glasses. They love to go to a brewery and see the different, you know, glasses that they print their logo on. It's nice to see that there's more of a variety now. Um, you're, you're not seeing very many breweries just, you know, printing their lo logo on like a shaker pint. Like we kind of all know that that's not the, the favorite glass for beer anymore, I guess. Um, so if you're into it, like, and you want to drink your beer out of a glass, that's like a vase with a flower in it, <laughs> go for it. But if you want to have, if you want to just drink like beer out of your wine glasses at home or your water glasses, that works too, I think. Okay. Yeah. So I know like there's like um, a couple of different style of pint glasses. So you touched on one, Shaker, Nonick, and Manchester. Mm -hmm. What are the, is there a real difference between those glasses? I mean, other than it's a pint glass and then they're different shapes. Um, so I not as is the Manchester pint. That's like the Guinness. That's yeah. Kind of tulip. Yeah. That's yeah. What I um, so nonic pints, it's actually uh, just like for the barkeep. So, you know, if you ever stack a shaker pint, they'll kind of like get stuck and you have to either like run them underwater or kind of right. twist them. And so if you're a bartender with like a popular bar where you're just pulling the handle and filling glasses, you know, you don't have time to be messing, trying to get them apart or breaking glasses. 
So that little bubble on the nonic pint is just to keep it from sticking and breaking. It's actually called nonic because it was called the no nick. Like oh. you're not going to nick the edge of the glass when you're separating them. I didn't know that. Um, so that's totally just like a function. I guess if you are a person who entertains a lot post coronavirus, of course, or post pandemic, yeah, really. um, and you want to stack glasses 10 high, like that's a great one to get because they were literally created to not be damaged when stacking. Um, and then Manchester is just an aesthetic thing again, like it's going to, it, Guinness looks so pretty, like doing that nice nitro fall and that you have the nice big bulb at the top where you can see all the nitro bubbles and then the bottom is a little less uh, it's it's more narrow it's like you said hold on to the carbonation that's down there um and it has a pretty thick bottom just for that heat transfer from the table or anything like that so but again they're all going to be just pretty standard um pint glasses there's not much special going on with the rims or anything on those they've been nice wide openings so you can definitely get to the beer's aroma um and I feel like if people are intimidated, right, like if you're not into craft beer and you like order one for the first time, sometimes people are more comfortable getting a pint glass than they would be getting a tiku glass or something just to like try something new. Mm -hmm. So like that's a great reason to have those glasses around. Um, it's so much better to pour any beer out of the bottle or can just because you can't get to the aroma at all when it's in the can or bottle. Um, so if like having a shaker pint is what makes that accessible to people, that's awesome. I I, I totally get what you're saying. I know when mm -hmm. um, I started uh, kind of obsessing over craft beer, <clears throat> sorry, <laughs> and uh, I would be going around to the different breweries and a lot, and they'd have all these different glasses, and I was just like, just give me a plain glass, give me a plastic glass, I'd be happy with that. <laughs> and they go, yeah. like, well, no, and they're like, no, 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 this is what it's I'm like, I, <laughs> I don't understand what you're doing. Uh, come yeah. forward, come forward a little bit. Now it's like it's still a little intimidating when uh, you go and you order the beer that comes in, and you get that tiku glass, and you're like, mm -hmm. okay, what kind of a ride am I going to go on now with this beer? Yeah. So you're always thinking, what does this, what does this style of glass mean for this beer? I mean, other than it being mm -hmm. a really good time and having a really good beer, um, I find that sometimes the right glass actually does um enhance the flavor of the beer uh the reason why i say that is is if you hold it not necessarily they say like a tiku by the by the stem but by the actual uh glass uh container part itself and you allow your hands to actually warm up the beer a little bit i find that it actually does change the molecular structure a little bit to actually um release a little bit more of that hot flavor that's in the beer or even a little bit more of maybe a, a malt flavor uh, that could be there because I do know that, like you said, the colder something is, the longer like head retentions there, uh, gas uh, retention or CO two retentions there. Um, mm -hmm. But it also does suppress a lot of the different types of flavors that you get that when things warm up. Yeah, so I mean, those flavors, as far as like molecular structure, those flavors are always there. It also has to do with how sensitive. So certain flavors, especially like sweetness we're most sensitive to when it's at our body temperature. So things will taste sweeter the closer they are to like our body temperature. That's actually why if you taste melted ice cream, it will taste super sweet because it's made to be eaten cold. So they have to make it extra sweet. So it tastes cold when it's going into your mouth when it's cold. Um, so that's not actually like the, the molecular structure changing. It's just as it's approaching your body temperature, as it's warming up, you're able to sense those things more deeply okay. i guess more intensely the intensity seems to go up to your body and also beyond just keeping that head retention and keeping the gas in solution with the temperature as it gets warmer since co2 cannot stay in the liquid just it, because of science <laughs> i'm trying to think of the right <laughs> word i was gonna say chemistry but i was like that's not right no. um basically it's forcing the co2 out and when those molecules are co2 are coming out of your glass little aroma molecules are like hanging on to them. They're stuck to the side, right? So like, as it's floating up, you might be getting like a molecule of like cis-3 hexanol, which is what makes hops smell super green and fresh. And like, um, so that will just be stuck to a CO2 molecule. It's kind of like a, a little passenger that as it's warming up and all this gas is being released, all of those aroma molecules are just kind of like along for the ride. And that's what we sense so much more of like, Oh, we're getting all these flavors we're, we're as it's warming like a lot of people think things become like 
quote unquote juicier now, like more citrus forward. And that's just your, your body kind of coming to the right temperature with the liquid as well as all of that CO2 carrying its little aroma passengers along um, <laughs> as it's coming out. So that's really what like Dogfish Head was trying to do um, when they were designing that glass was like get you to warm it up. So it's like right. now, cause you know, people don't maybe think that like close to room temperature beer is super tempting or uh, I don't know. <laughs> like, well, maybe they think say, they where are we? Where they're people are gonna go, where are we in the UK? I'll tell you this. Yeah, right exactly. Now. I've spent enough time in the UK that mm -hmm. it's not room temperature beer. It's not. Yeah, it's it's fifty five. Yeah, I mean, I've had I've actually had the hand pulled glasses where they're coming straight out of the cask. Mm -hmm. and those are some of the best beers I've ever had, and mm -hmm. that's introducing a, a little bit of oxygen into it as they pump it out to give it a little bit of head to to I guess kind of activate the CO two that's naturally been there but the glasses you get are just as equally interesting i mean i've seen them where they look like a a, a vising glass but they go super skinny at the base almost like a champagne flute and they mm -hmm. come up and some of those glasses are fantastic and the beers are just as great but like we were like we've been saying it's an adventure it, you choose what you want yeah. And I mean, the UK is a good example of like tradition, um, deciding what glasses you're drinking out of in different parts of the UK, they do use what you're talking about, that restrictor plate when it's coming out of the cask to create a head. Yep. Um, but most, a lot of places in the UK, they want their glass filled totally to the very top and have no head or they think they're getting ripped off. So in different places in the UK, like Fuller's will have two glasses, one for places where they don't want a head and they want it totally full and one that's a little larger oh. where they understand they're not getting ripped off if they have one or two fingers of head on top of their beer. Um, so. That's, I did not know that. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Okay. I'm going to have to go visit Fuller's next time I'm in the UK. Yeah. Yeah. Or I mean, I mean, <clears throat> anywhere. So like Sam Smith's has the same, like, uh, I'm trying to, I don't want to say it wrong. I, I know it's either the North or the South, whichever one doesn't want the head <laughs> but yeah Sam Smith's all those like kind of you know pubs will have the same situation where they, they some places have the ones with the line where your beer goes to there and then the top yeah. is head and then the other ones have the smaller glasses and it's just no all head right. all the way full <laughs> okay here's a trivia question then maybe you can answer it for me so <laughs> um Guinness glasses uh if they have the royal cipher or the queen's seal on it is it illegal if they pour it a certain way that it's if it's not poured right it's a criminal offense that, that would be for a guinness expert i didn't the queen's seal I, yeah of, her yeah, cipher okay. so so the, her cipher so basically uh if you look at some of them in certain places actually have the queen's cipher or her crown on it and mm -hmm. oh her, yes i know you're talking about okay for for some reason, I've heard this, and I don't know if it's true or not. Guys, if you're listening to me, don't you can call me out on it. I don't care. I admit I don't know. Um, but I've heard over many years that if it's not poured right, it's it's deemed a criminal offense, and you can be air quotes charged <laughs> for 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 doing yeah. that. I would say maybe there there definitely have been like lawsuits in the past about um, people not getting a full pint or having like maybe they're saying if they didn't fill it up enough that could be a crime but maybe. Um, or yeah people misleading and saying like oh this is a pint but they're actually serving them a little less than a pint um, but yeah I don't know about that um, specifically I just know about how to draw the shamrock on uh, <laughs> the top of the Guinness after it's, it's, it's poured it, out of the nitro it's a stamp. <laughs> No, no, no. You, you, no, you, you uh, push it back the other way, like the top handle. Yeah. So, you get, so it comes out really, and then you draw the. Really? The yeah. <laughs> wow. If All you're right. a good bartender, I'm horrible at doing it. I've, I practiced it a few times in a class, but um, the really, the real pros can make it look just like a real shamrock. Wow. So uh, then I got <laughs> robbed because last time I had a Guinness in an Irish pub, uh, they had like a shamrock stamp. They just stamped the top of the beer. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't pour it it's funny um, all right well i think instead of trying to beat a dead horse i think we've covered everything what do you think yeah i think we're good 
Well, oh, actually, sh- there was one thing we what? talked about this before, but I just wanted people to know, like when we are judging beer or taking our Cicerone tests or QA oh, yeah. panels in breweries, like the, the people who are tasting at the highest, highest end of tasting is um, tasting out of plastic cups. So I think anyone who feels like they don't have good enough glassware to have like a nice beer or they need to buy a glass, you know, when they go buy their yeah. special barrel aged sour, just should know that even a plastic cup would be fine. <laughs> You'd still get all the flavors. So. so then what is the purpose of the plastic cup when you're doing the beer tasting? Is it just, just so there's no cross contamination or is it just an easy take a drip, chuck it, move on? Yeah, it's a little bit of both. So yeah, cross contamination is definitely something like you know, if you're, if you're an NHC, you're at the final table and you get poured into a glass that had a tiny bit of like, I don't know, I'm trying to think if you were at the lager table and there was a tiny bit of dried lambic in there or something, it could totally ruin your glass. And that would be so unfair when it was being judged. Um, and it also, I mean, honestly has to do with uh, sustainability as well. Like when you think about how much water is used on those tiny sample glasses to clean them, it's just a lot of water, a lot of heat, a lot of energy. because they have to then go into a dryer that uses a lot of energy. So using those small sample glasses is cleaner. It's consistent. Like you're never going to have scratches or like nucleation points on them. Um, and yeah, it actually, as long as you recycle them, uh, is better for the environment over well, overall as well. Thank you for reminding me. I appreciate that. <laughs> yeah. And I, I, I did enter the NHC this year. Same. So you did? What did you enter? Yeah, of course. I don't know. I actually, I don't know if you can see this box, these boxes back here. Um, these are my boxes of all the homebrew that uh, is waiting for us to do a final tasting and see which ones we feel like are best. Uh, wow. Going. See, I'm, I'm, yeah. submit, I'm submitting uh, 24 bottles, but, but of uh, so four, four entries, four entries yeah. of like, and then 355 bottles. So I'm, I'm Oh, interesting. So, so six bottles of each beer because they mm-hmm. they said minimum of five. And I'm like, okay, I'll just send six. And just make yeah, because this is the first year they're doing just one round. Yeah, uh, yeah. So I'm different. So I'll just send six. So I'm sending a brown porter, uh, an elderflower pale ale, uh, a, a historical beer from Scotland made with heather tips, and mm. a chocolate espresso oatmeal stout. Wow. So does the elderflower pale ale go into spice beer or where does it go? Uh, I, th- I, th- yeah, I'm pretty sure that went into the spice slash me. It's like herbal spice. Something, yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 And the, the um, one with the Heather tips, I just, it, going into the historical s- section and mm-hmm. it's not there because <laughs> it's it's oh. pr- it's pronounced uh, or spelled f r o a c h which and that beer dates back to 2000 uh b c e wow so i was just like okay give it a try but it, there was no place for it so i figured okay just put it in with regular international pale ales so we'll, we'll, we'll see what it, see how yeah. it does yeah definitely yeah, mine, oh. will, mine will all be some kind of Belgian or German. I have a bunch of boy spears, a bunch of oh. Belgian strongs and saison yeah. and stuff. So yeah, I'm not big. I'm not big on the Belgian beers. I don't know why. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't know if it's because that's. I find sometimes the yeast gives out like that <laughs> kind of funky banana taste, or or, or not. But yeah, that's, I mean that's what. Yeah, definitely that's what it's made to. <laughs> so I'm last Kate. <laughs> See, I love German. I love German beers, but it's the beers, things like uh, the Helles, the the Martzens, the alt, alt beers. Mm-hmm. Those are the things I really, really, really enjoy. And, yeah, and Germans per- just make those so much better than I can. So, oh. <laughs> <laughs> and basically, I'm a sucker for a good British beer. Yeah, great choice. So, so I'm going to say we're good to go. Mandy, thank you very much for being on the show this week. Yeah. I greatly appreciate it. Guys, um, please go check her out on YouTube. She has some really cool videos. I really like the one where she does a taste test blindfolded. Uh, that's one. Of, that's actually a really fun to watch because it's pretty impressive of what you can do when you can't see something or what your senses can actually deliver. Uh, check her on on Instagram. Uh, I believe you also have Facebook. Um mm-hmm. Uh, check it out on Facebook and 
uh, if you uh, can, also go and check out some of the, the stuff on magazines and columns that she's writing for. Very informative stuff. Please check it out. Uh, and uh, yeah, thanks for tuning in this week and a beer or two along the way and one more time around the sun and we'll see you on their side. Mandy, thank you so much. We'll see you soon. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. So I'd like to say thank you to Mandy for being on the show this week. If you get a chance, check out Beers with Mandy on Instagram, Facebook, I believe Twitter, and also check out the places that she writes for. I'll be including those in the description. And guys, again, thanks a lot for tuning in and taking the time to come join for a beer or two along the way. And I'll see you on the other side. Bye.